Pathonegal Monte Carlo simulations. I have not worked very much on bosons, but um, David um, has written a very nice review about simulations on helium-4 and has done um, very fundamental simulations with this method. In principle, Pathonegal Monte Carlo is the ideal simulation method for bosons because besides some approximations that you can control very well, it's actually an exact method, <coughs> which is not true for fermions. So we have here only controlled approximations like the system size or the time step we're using. But in principle, I'm going to tell you an exact method for quantum systems. So to bring everybody on the same page, um, I would basically remind ourselves what are bosons and fermions. We have um, even integer spins and fermions do not. We have photons and different types of, um, sort of more complex particles. Fermions, we have electrons, protons, quarks, neutrons, if you like. Then we have compound particles. And um, helium-4 atoms are on a whole behave like a boson. And helium-3 atoms, um, because we combine them out of different fermions, they behave like a um, fermion. So the, the compound particles are very important, and they determine the statistics. For example, we have Bose-Einstein condensation for bosonic systems, and the rock distribution that arises for um, helium-3 atoms, for example, and electrons and protons, if you like. The wave functions are symmetric for bosons, so you have to make your, bose your wave functions symmetric. Only the symmetric wave functions should be considered. And for fermions, it's only the anti-symmetric wave functions that matter for the system. The effects are we have Bose condensation for bosons, and we have Pauli exclusion for fermions. So how does it arise in the pathonegal formulation? Well, if we have the exact density matrix, then or the exact eigenstates, we only sum over the symmetric ones, and we construct a bosonic density matrix. And we have a sum over all those symmetric eigenstates. Here, we have the sum over all anti-symmetric eigenstates. Or everything else needs to be thrown away. You have to determine all of them, unless, unless you can't. In, real, in reality, we can only do these things for um, free particles again. If we have interactions or systems, we need a pathological simulation to discover those or recover those interaction effects. So how can we do that? And there's a simple trick that arrives, and we can project out symmetric or anti-symmetric states by introducing a sum over permutations on the um, eigenstates of the distinguishable particle system. So if you have the eigenstates without worrying about bosonic or fermionic effects, you just stick the sum of all permutations in here, and your sum over permutations are prime here, and as a result, you're projecting out only those states that are either symmetric or anti-symmetric. In the system for fermions, you have a minus sign, for, and for bosons, you have a plus. So what this really means is um, you have your distinguishable um, this density matrix, is all we talked about in the previous lecture, and you sample of all those permutations. So going from R to R prime, you now have to go from R to all possible permutations of R prime. And you add all those permutations to a, with a plus sign um, for bosons and with a minus sign for fermions. So in pathonegals, this means the following. You write down your full pathonegals, but outside of it, you have a sum of all pers possible permutations. So what does it really mean to have a permutation in the system? And that means for bosons that um, you have these paths that they wiggle back and forth. These are sort of distinct. So this is distinguishable particles here. So nothing has happened. But now we have permutations, which means you're starting at a path that has where the R1 path starts at R1 and the R2 path starts at 2. But then they end up at the other location. So the R1 path goes to R2. The coordinates are permuted. And the R1 2 path goes back to the um, coordinate of R1. So as a result, you just take the two polymers and cross-link them. What were two individual paths here become one long polymer in imaginary time. So if you unroll this, 
you would be walking in this direction forward, you end up at R2, and then you go back here and you basically continue your walk twice as long in imaginary time, and you have a longer polymer as a result. This is a permutation. So path can get longer as a result. Systems can be more quantum mechanical, and those permutations now need to be added to your simulation. So you have bosons, all of those additional states, all of those permutations need to be sampled, and they are added with a weight of 1. No problem, eights of 1 we're totally happy with. Then we have for fermions, we have a weight of minus 1, and that's the killer, as we'll see. Because you have some contributions that come with a negative sign, and some come with a positive sign. And we're going to spend um, a long time understanding how to deal with this problem. It's fundamental, it's non-trivial, and there's no exact solution if you have negative contributions. So for um, bosons, the effects are still fundamental, but we have a good computational method to do that. And what happens is, so quantum, if the particles are not permuting, you just have these little ring polymers, like distinguishable particles, but if they do, then they can form these long chains, and if they go around across the box, then uh, these um, paths contribute to a superfluid signature. So these are bosonic effects. Superfluidity is a result of Bose condensation, and in our path angle simulations, they arise because paths link up and wind, we say. They go from one side in the purely bounding conditions, travel through the box, and re and exit on one side, and because of periodic conditions, they re-enter on the same side. So periodic means they have the same loop reappearing here, and you have this winding path that wind across the box in different directions. And the magnitude of this winding effect will determine how superfluid the system really is. Because you, in principle, you could permute at any slice. But the result is um, you only have to do this once. You have to, you, you just, it's a procedure. If you do not introduce permutations, you're sampling the distinguishable density matrix. If you introduce one permutation, you're already projecting out only the symmetric states. If you're introducing two permutations, you would be reprojecting out what you already have. So it doesn't make any difference. No, no, but uh, when, you're, when you're introducing the, in, the intermediate RIs, you're basically introducing resolution of identity, right, between those operators? Yeah. You, could, you could stick another permutation operator on there. It would make your code more complicated. The results would be the same. Well, uh, yeah, so I, th that's my sort of where I'm sort of not seeing. The point is why the results will be same because when you do the resolution of identity, that should only include symmetric states. If you are introducing a distinguishable, distinguishable particle identity, you have more, you are spanning more states than what is needed for the resolution of the uh, identity operator. I think if you introduce, well, it's a different way to think about it. So. Um, so you're asking why are you not introducing more permutations at intermediate slices? So I'm not sure I have the perfect answer. I'm inclined to say you only need perm to permute once to get the, result, the exact result. What happens if you do it multiple times? I'm actually not sure what this So I'm, I'm not sure I have the best answer. I just can tell you what we do is sufficient to get the projections. I don't think you need to do that, but I'm not sure. And maybe ask David separately. He may have a better, more satisfactory answer. Yeah, we can talk about yeah. the okay. So for fermions, what we ultimately do is we have these negative signs, and we introduce this fixed node approximation that will be the, to the topic of the last lecture of this morning. So permutation sampling. How does it work? So we have to we have sampling the path, but now we also have to cross-link path in a different way. So before, we just picked this imaginary time window, removed the path, and um, basically um, regrew them one by one. Now we're doing this for three particles simultaneously. We're cutting out three 
sections for three different particles which we've chosen at random and we want to now permute them. So if you do not permute them, we have the identity permutation which we had before, but we just that path still links up at the original path and all the, those two others. So now we introduce the first two particle permutation and um, we will have three ways of doing that by cross-linking different, um, different particles. And the result is what happens if you have three particle permutations. There are three ways of doing that here for um, two particles. There's basically these two, then these two can also be cross-linked. And there's also particle one and particle three can permute. There's three ways of doing that. So that would be a two particle permutation. Can someone tell me if I want to introduce a three particle permutation where I cross-link all of them, how many ways are there? Someone says six. Someone says three. Sorry? Three. Three. So two people say three, one people say six. Can I have any other answer? Two. Okay. Do you have any argument? You just guessed, or do you have any reason for saying two? <laughs> so, one, three, two, well, one, two, three is the same as crossing two, three, one. It's the same as crossing three, one, two. But you can't. You can't uh, just circularly permute to get like uh, one three two, for example. Yes, so um, I think this is exactly the right answer. It's cyclic permutations, and basically what I'm proposing here is that um, this particle goes to the right, this particle goes to the right, and then the one that basically goes to the right, but it's actually would basically go back to the one the remaining link. So you can do this to the right, including to the left. As a result, um, you have two ways of introducing a three-particle cyclic permutation. So well done. Um, how about some um, <laughs> chocolate? <laughs> so you pick one. And um, would you have guessed the answer? No. I think you need some performing drags, too. So <laughs> you pass this around. And um, so I have some more. So everybody can have one. And, um, <laughs> No, not okay. So, you should, so everybody should get one piece, so that you stay awake and you can count more permutations. The reason why people said six is we have um, three particles. Um, you have six ways to permute, and if you add them all up, it's basically one plus three plus two. You get back your six. But in the six permutations, the identity permutation, which is number one here, is already in there. And I was asking you for two particle permutations. So in principle, you were all, nobody said five, nobody said four, so I think we all were all good. So, um, okay. So basically now we have the following dilemma. We have to propose how you cross-link polymers. And we again do what we can do best. We go back to free particle sampling. We cut out this section of imaginary time. We know the starting point and all the possible endpoints of our path. And now we basically look what permutation carries what weight according to the free particle solution. So we determine how we cross-link polymers just on the free particle <coughs> propagator. And we build a giant table for all two particle and all three particle permutations. And there are a lot of them, and it takes time to do that. And um, what we then do, we just pick the table, we know the weight for each individual state, and then we pick a particular um, permutation, and then we regrow the um, permuted path using the bisection or the levy construction. Once we know where we should end up, we can just go march in that direction, and the code doesn't know that this is the bosonic or fermionic problem. Just by introducing these permutations, you then recover the bosonic result, but the actual bisection method is blind to this fact, as long as you tell it where it should go. So let's review. We pick three particles, or actually we pick all possible permutations, and we build this giant table. In the table, we pick which particles we want to permute. And then we start the bisection. By picking the permutation, we know where we want to end up. And well, how does it really work? Well, um, let's say we have a helium system. Here we have these helium particles 
shown by this large sphere. And helium particles are clunky objects, and they almost interact with a hard sphere potential. They really log are heading, they're really hitting very hard. So it's not like electrons have a relatively soft Coulomb potential, but helium um, particles are heavy and um, sort of uh, with very repulsive um, objects. And you have two particle permutations. Nevertheless, you can permute them. And the free particle sampling method will just be based on distances. So it will less likely choose a permutation where the particles are far apart. More likely are those are close by. But it's completely blind to the fact that there's another guy in the way. So what really would have to happen for these two particles to permute is to involve this guy. So this is like a sort of additional corruption. If you want to get a money transfer here, there's someone in the middle, you have to get this person involved. So the way to do that is to do a three particle permutation. So now you see um, uh, there's a lot of um, variational freedom, so organized crime effectively can take effect, and there's still way, so many ways to link polymers. It's all in this imaginary time. So I've just penciled in a few possible three particle permutations, and by involving this guy um, in imaginary time, these paths can sort of dance around each other. It's like um, a triple helix. If you remember your um, DNA structure, then um, if you take a triple helix, they could go around each other and permute, even if they have very little space. So permutation in imaginary time, the fact that they could simultaneously travel, makes these um, simul uh, permutations possible, even in cases where the particle are very, very big and repulsive. So um, we include all three particle permutations, and, but we still use free particle um, sampling for them. So we do not include these um, interaction effects, and it becomes a problem. If we're going to go to longer um, permutations, we have four particle exchanges, and um, they are important. In principle, you could always recover them. If you sample with three particle permutations and then you add a, another two particle permutation, you can generate a three particle permutation. So in a Monte Carlo sense, in principle, you would get away with just introducing two particle um, permutations and just do many of them, and you would recover all those permutations, but for efficiency reasons, it makes sense to uh, include those three and four particle permutations at once because for that reason that they can go around each other. And secondly, um, you would, um, it's more efficient, but building this table gets increasingly complex. So five and six is hopeless, and typically we run out of um, energy when we generate the four particle um, exchanges. We try to construct this table as efficiently as possible. We cut off unlikely cases right away. If this particle wants to permute with this one over here, we just don't even think about it. Yes? Is this sort of related to Feynman's argument for, for bosons? Feynman's argument for bosons. I think the whole... Yeah, we will, we'll come to that when we call, talk about the solid. So Feynman invented this method to study superfluid helium. And yes, so we will talk about exchanges in the solid at the end of this lecture. Okay, so once we picked our permutation, we regrow the path and we accept or reject based on the um, interactions. So that can be devastating. If you ignored one of those particles and you're just trying to walk through it, it will just be rejected because the uh, the potential is very repulsive. So if you have um, a superfluid system, I already said that it's related to this winding of the path. So how does it really work? Well, one of the classic examples was the work by um, Seppoli and Pollock, who actually reproduced the lambda transition at the right temperature um, with PMC calculations. So if you take a StatMac class and you determine the superfluid um, or the Bose-Einstein condensation, you basically get the free particle result. And many analytical theories are based on free particles, and the result is, I think, 2.7 or 4 Kelvin at the corresponding densities. You basically do not get the correct um, transition temperature. So path integrals is the method of choice to study these problems. And this is a beautiful um, result to produce the experimental um, findings. So the uh, heat capacity diverges at the transition from a normal fluid to a superfluid. 
So it is related to Bose condensation, and it occurs when the um, thermal de Broglie wavelength um, becomes of the order of magnitude of the interparticle spacing given by this condition. So the particles have to be close enough to cross-link to start permutations, and that's the sig signature for bosonic effects. Um, many systems thus do not show this. Even hydrogen, if you go to low enough temperature where this is satisfied, hydrogen will freeze in molecular form into a solid. And people looked for superfluid um, hydrogen and the confining uh, forces in a hydrogen crystal are always bigger unless you have some confined geometry. You may have a two-dimensional system. You may be able to perturb your hydrogen atoms, then they would go superfluid. But if you have a bulk hydrogen, it will freeze because the interactions between the atoms are stronger than the zero-point motion. If the zero-point motion wins, any system will go superfluid because, um, well, unless you confine it. That's just by the nature of the system. So what is really superfluidity? Um, it's basically um, a superfluid flows out of your container. It has no surface tension. And um, what systems has it been um, seen for? Well, um, there is helium-4, which is a boson. And um, this phase diagram below 2 Kelvin has a large superfluid um, fraction, uh, section. And you have a solid, which is not a super fluid, but it could be a super solid. We may touch upon that. And if you increase temperature, the path shrink, the permutations will disappear, and it goes back to a normal state. If we have helium-3, well, helium-3 is a fermion, so they can both condense. But they can do a trick. They can basically pair up. And once they form pairs, then two bosons make a, uh, two fermions pair up to a bosonic state. And then those pairs can then both condense. This happens at uh, millikelvin rather than two Kelvin. And another Nobel Prize was given for when this system was described. Um, we have uh, laser-cooled atoms in magnetic traps. When people succeeded, it was another Nobel Prize. So in principle, for every bullet here, there was at least one Nobel Prize given. Now we have molecules in magnetic traps at nano-Kelvin temperatures. And um, most recently, Kim and Chang proposed that even solid helium-4 uh, may have some superfluid signature. So that was the proposal of a supersolid that um, has been discussed intensely. So let's just look what superfluidity really means. And the definition is um, coming from an um, experiment where you have a toroidal oscillator. So you basically, you imagine you have a bucket of helium, and you suspend it from a string, and you start spinning it. You start spinning it back and forth and you measure the moment of inertia, which is, um, you can determine by your um, angular frequency, omega. So what you will observe, you can either think about this problem in angular coordinates where you have the moment of inertia is i, and you have the angular momentum is z, and it's just spinning back and forth, but it's just the same thing if you think about real momentum, linear momentum, and um, mass, is the equivalent to the moment of inertia. If you take the derivative of the momentum with respect to the velocity and you take the limit of the velocity going to zero. So a classical system, you always have the linear dependence of momentum being linear related to velocity and it's the mass of the system that's the proportionality. Now you're doing this super, f you have your helium bucket, you see how it's oscillating back and forth and you cool it below 2 Kelvin, then all of a sudden, without you touching anything, the bucket will all of a sudden oscillate faster. As you go through transition, it will go slowly initially, and then all of a sudden it speeds up. And the speeding up is the effect that um, the, um, the proportionality between momentum and velocity is reduced. You can think about it that um, it's only a part of your helium atoms contribute to the oscillations, or you can say that the moment of inertia is non-classical. So a signature of superfluidity is the non-classical rotational inertia. So what you keep in mind, you have this bucket, it oscillates at a certain frequencies, 
It goes through this transition and the oscillations speed up without you touching it. So the signature that arises, the superfluid state below the transition has um, certain plateaus in your momentum distribution that are given by um, quantized circulation, given by this formula, and the superfluid will deviate from your classical line that relates momentum and velocity. So and Landau gave a very intuitive or puzzling picture. He calls this the two-fluid model, where he splits the density of your system in a superfluid part and in a normal component. And if you like, you can split the mass in some superfluid part and the normal part. And the normal part is just the proportionality factor that you measure here. So you're missing the superfluid part. For some reason, the superfluid component of your system can both condense into a state and thus no longer rotate. And the normal component does. So this simple model describes most of the effects are observed in the experiment. It's amazing. But in reality, of course, there's only one type of helium atoms in the system. It's just that the quantum system behaves in a way as you could split it into a, sol into a um, super solid, a super fluid and a normal component. So this is the signature. If you do an experiment, you look for this where the proportionality is no longer the full mass. You look for some reduction. So you have a um, the superfluid fraction is then the fraction of that um, of the superfluid density with respect to the whole density. This is the superfluid fraction defined here. So there's another interesting experiment um, that you can do. Imagine you start you have no longer have a, an oscillator. You just have a way to spin your bucket with helium, and helium is at four kelvin. It's perfectly. Um, it's a normal fluid. So you just spin it at some constant rate. Then you cool it below the superfluid transition. What will happen, um, helium will pick some of those states here. And you have now have a rotating superfluid, and you slowly stop your bucket. What will happen, the normal part of your um, um, system will basically come to rest and the superfluid fraction of your system will keep rotating. So you generate what's known as a persistent current. So the superfluid flows frictionless. It doesn't care whether there is a normal component in the fluid. It's just there's a part that will keep spinning. It's very hard to get rid of that part. Even if you try to hold and shake the bucket, if you shake it enough, you can probably break it. But to remove all superfluid currents is very, very difficult. Unless you heat it up, above the superfluid transition, everything becomes a normal fluid and all these currents disappear. So with this experiment, you can generate persistent currents. So what happens in the pathological computation, um, the goal that was stated was to compute the superfluid fraction and the transition temperature for an interacting system. <coughs> so if you pretend you have your bucket and this, you just make it so it has thin walls now, and the system will um, you have fluid that's only in an annulus uh, around a cylinder, then um, you say you have a system with moving walls effectively. You have to modify your Hamiltonian that includes these moving walls by changing the momentum um, operator here, and you still have periodic boundary conditions as you find. So in a system with moving walls, the um, boundary conditions stay the same, but the Hamiltonian gets modified. So you can um, determine the momentum, um, expectation value of the momentum operator um, in a exact quantum mechanical or pathological Monte Carlo simulation. And then that determines your normal fraction. So the proportionality between momentum and velocity is the normal fraction of your Hamiltonian, and it's related to the free energy difference between a rotating and a non-rotating fluid. So you can do it an equivalent system where you go and basically change it to the uh, stationary walls, and now you basically have the original Hamiltonian, but you have to modify the boundary conditions. So this is you change rather than changing the Hamiltonian, 
um, you have stationary walls, you're rotating with the system, and you change the boundary conditions. So if you walk around, if you have a system in periodic boundary conditions, you walk around the whole cell, you pick up a phase factor that's related to the velocity. So now you can compute the free energy difference between a rotating and a non-rotating um, fluid. And that part, um, if you think about what path in your system are affected by the rotation. If you walk around the system, you're picking up this phase factor. If you walk along the path, the phase factor is only being introduced if you have the path that bind around the cell. So every path that goes around the cell picks up this phase factor due to this winding factor here. So this winding path are affected by the, um, the rotating um, system and will pick up this one factor here. So as a result, you can derive an expression for the superfluid fraction of your system and that's related to the winding number. So what you really have to do is you, um, you have a path angle simulation. You count as one of your estimators is how many windings occur. So, and you will then compute the superfluid fraction. And it does go to 1 in the limit of t equals 0. So, um, even though the system is strongly interacting, it will both condense into a state that's completely superfluid. So, the challenges for um, um, computing this efficiently for large systems is to get the permutations to converge. So it's very difficult to get... Um, for systems more than, I would say, uh, 100 particles to converge all the winding numbers. Even though we have a, um, an exact method, this is an ergodic problem, um, to cross-link all polymers, that you generate enough of those long connected chains that really, for a large cell, you sample all this winding space efficiently is difficult. So um, it's one of the... Um, it's been done for small systems, but you always have to extrapolate to large ones, so that's not trivial. N nevertheless, uh, many good properties have been derived from those path angle simulations. So there is another way to estimate the, um, the superfluid um, fraction in a finite system where you do not deal with periodic boundary conditions, and that's the area estimator, and it can be shown if you count, if you determine the area of a path, shown here, and you square it, you can also relate this to the superfluid fraction in a, in a system of a finite number of particles. So you have a system of a droplets here that is, shows a similar behavior. So if the droplets were small enough that you could simulate them, then you could use the area estimator to um, determine a superfluid fraction in a different way. So one confusing part is, so far we talked about the super, uh, the superfluid fraction, and that goes to 1 in the limit of low temperature. So then there is another fraction that's just there for your confusion, and it's called the condensate fraction. The condensate fraction um, is defined as the fraction of particles that goes to the zero momentum state. And it's basically a historical definition. It's just there because people thought when you do this free particle analogy, Bose condensation means they go to the zero momentum state. But that was a confusion. That's not true. Bose condensation just means it goes to the ground state, but it doesn't have to be a state of zero momentum. Nevertheless, um, we want to understand the relationship between the condensate fraction, which means what fraction of the particles have zero momentum, and determine it. So the momentum distribution um, will basically, it's the limit um, of all states that have zero momentum, and if you cool a system to low temperature, it's only 10%. So for some reason, we have um, a system, the system to 100% goes superfluid. Super fra superfluid fraction is 100%, but the condensate fraction is only 10%. Any suggestions what the way out of this conundrum is? Or why is the difference so large? Why, why does the, you learn in StatMac, everything goes to the ground state, that's zero, that is zero momentum, and everything goes superfluid. That's what you learned. Now we have a result that says everything goes superfluid, but only 10% goes to, the, um, to that state. Any suggestions? If you have a system that's 
you get the zero point energy? The zero point energy, I think that's already in here. The effect is basically interactions. So if you have all the um, helium particles happily condensed to, the ground, to some ground state, but particles are still strongly interacting, and therefore it's not a state of zero momentum. Zero momentum would be perfectly plane waves, no imperfections, no, this could be, no um, the density would be uniform. And that can't be, because they still repel each other and cannot go to the superfluid state. So there's a difference. We can calculate this with simulations with open path. This is exactly your question. You would basically open one polymer, and you measure the distribution, how does this end behave, and you Fourier transform as you get the momentum distribution. So it's done for bosons and fermions, and the result is normally this path here goes to zero. If you have one particle path, that will just, the end cannot go very far. But in the, in the moment when you have Bose condensation, you have um, other particles you cross link, and then this whole polymer gets longer, and therefore the momentum distribution does not decay to zero. This is known as off-diagonal long-range order, and it's another signature for a superfluid behavior, and um, you basically can determine it from pathological simulations. Any more questions? So I think since I um, talked, I'm just going to say a few things about the supersolid. Um, and as far, there was a um, an exciting experiment, um, given that a possible um, system of solid helium was measured to have some non-classical moment of inertia. And what happens, Kim and Chang basically um, had the normal behavior as a function of temperature and then determined that um, some of those, um, all of a sudden when they cooled it below a 0.2 Kelvin, the bucket was spinning up, even though the system was under pressure. They detected something that resembled some of the properties of um, a super solid, where apparently you can have some ex permionic exchange effects in this system. So I was going to review a little bit of the um, findings without going into too much detail. Um, it was already, David um, sort of studied these systems before, and you have a, um, a HCP crystal, um, the signature is if you send X-ray beams through, then you can determine that the particles are indeed on a lattice. It's with an X-ray diffraction experiment. In principle, it's not allow, it's not forbidden that this crystal could have some super solid properties, but it's difficult because you do not get enough permutations in a solid because particles often run into each other. This is one example of two particle exchanges, and they're very rare because you have the confinement of the other um, particles. So to look at possible permutations, I went to um, Bernard Bernou's website, who basically looked at these things for the Wigner crystal and now worried, how it, what exchanges do you get? And the Wigner crystal is more forgiving than helium, but nevertheless, it's interesting to count permutations. So here you have a two-particle permutation, and he computed the density as a result. Here you have three-particle permutations and four-particle permutations. And um, you can go f along and study more permutations and longer chains in um, a crystal. So the one important calculation that was done to study whether a supersolid can exist to look for how what's the energy cost to the free energy by introducing a one long polymer exchange. So you, do a, you start one particle here and you try to cross link it with this one, with this one, this one, and you keep doing this for a larger and larger cell and you determine the free energy cost of such a permutation. So this is, has been worked out by um, Seppoli and Bernou in a uh, first review letter article saying the energy cost is too high. So the argument is that in the perfect crystal, you cannot have a superfluid. And that was an important contribution to the whole discussion while the experimentalist and the theorists tried to work out whether a supersolid exists, whether the Kim and Chang experiments are actually valid. So there were lots of PLs written on this. There were workshops organized just to understand that part. And um, 
some good things came about it. I'm not sure actually that we found a super solid, it's actually very unlikely at this point, but some good things came out of it nevertheless. So here um, I'm quoting the worm algorithm for grand canonical um, PIMC. We're not going to talk about it, but in principle what they did is they had the polymers we just described and allowed for polymers to grow and shrink. And that allowed for more efficient sampling in a dense solid system. So it was a new idea just um, to make more efficient sampling in that regime where super solid is possible. So Edgar, this is the paper I was sort of referring to, they proposed that screw dislocations would be one way to have a superfluid state um, in, a, in a crystal. It's unlikely that this works in my opinion because you have to have an increasingly large number of permutations to support a super solid state. So this is just one scenario. So it's not sufficient that there is a super solid prediction. So David has already disproved that in a perfect crystal you cannot have a super uh, solid behavior. Here with screw dislocations it's also difficult because you need to show that you have many of them. So um, most recently um, the group of uh, around John Reppy questions the results whether the super solid is actually a super solid. And they detected results that um, related to this A, how, you, how fast you cool your system. So there could be an effect that relates to um, your imperfections in your, system, in your crystal. That's one possible you know, defects, screw dislocations, that could trigger the uh, super solid behavior and give you a fake signature. And also, uh, more recently, they think it's just another effect that has maybe a um, well, the limit of velocity equals zero, um, you should see a signature, and they cannot reproduce it. So at the moment, it's questionable whether this really relates to a super solid at all. So that's what I wanted to say about super solids in general, or superfluid behavior, and it's about um, the, uh, it's just a way to, for us to talk about permutation. So any questions about bosons? Yes. When do you need to, you were talking about distinguishable particles and bosons. When do you really need the bosons? When, when do you need the bosons? What's the difference between a um, distinguishable particle simulation and the bosonic case? And the argument is, um, it relates to the fact as you cool a system with temperature, then the path will get longer. And the question is whether this introduces exchange effects. If you have a perfectly confined gold atom sitting somewhere, and it has a very confined potential like on your, you may be carrying around on your finger, then exchange effects are not important because there's no chance that this gold atom will exchange with the other gold atom nearby. If you have no confinement, even a gold atom will have exchange effects. But if the gold atom sits in a gold crystal, this will never happen. So the argument is as soon as it's possible for path to cross link, as they have a large thermal de Broglie wavelength and are not confined in the crystal, then you need to worry about exchange effects and the distinguishable particle simulations will be wrong because in nature the system will be bosonic. The thermal de Broglie wavelength. That's fine if there's no confinement. If there is confinement, you have to worry about the zero-point motion compared to the well of your pot confining potential. Any other questions? All right, so this concludes this section on bosons. Produced by OCE Atlas Digital Media at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign.